previously. The point is that you can indeed run Unix on a Famicom. Run Unix on a Famicom. Unix on a Famicom. After my last video, some people were disappointed that I didn't achieve the goal of running Linux on the NES. So let's try this again. Just like last time, all of our code needs to run on the NES's processor, and our cartridge is limited to hardware that you could expect to find in commercial games of the era. But this time, we're not going to depend on the Famicom nor its accessories, and we're not going to settle for Unix. We're only allowed to use operating systems based on Linus Torvald's Linux kernel. Of course, for this to be even remotely possible, we'll need an incredibly lightweight and stripped down Linux distribution. The Embeddable Linux Kernel subset, or ELKS, will be our target operating system for this project, and it's surprisingly well suited to the NES when compared against the alternatives. This is because ELKS can run directly from ROM, with only 128 kilobytes of RAM, and it's designed to run on an IBM PC compatible with an 8086 processor. That's a more powerful CPU than the one in the NES, but the two are similar enough that it should still be possible to port ELKS. The trouble is that we'd likely have to rewrite most of the operating system to make it work, and if we do that, is it really still Linux? I don't know. So to play it safe, we won't be making a port. This, of course, begs the question, if we aren't porting ELKS, and we can't just put PC hardware in a cartridge, then how are we going to run Linux? Well, we'll do it the same way that we run video games on fundamentally incompatible hardware, with emulation. That's right, we're not just running Linux on the NES, we're running an IBM PC emulator. But wait, didn't I just say that the PC has a more powerful CPU than the NES? How do we emulate a more powerful system on a less powerful one? Well, considering that the NES is fairly slow to begin with, and that there will be some amount of emulation overhead, we can expect an emulator to run at a tiny fraction of the speed of a PC. We'll just have to hope that Linux is performant enough to make up for that to some extent. A much bigger problem for us is the memory. As previously mentioned, ELKS requires 128 kilobytes of RAM, and not only is that substantially more than the NES's built-in 2 kilobytes, it's more than the NES can even address. Of course, this is far from a new problem for the NES, and the well-established solution is to use a mapper chip. A mapper works by making only a small portion of the cartridge's total memory visible to the NES at any given time, and allowing the CPU to select which portion is visible. This is a technique known as bank switching, and it was made possible by a variety of mappers over the NES's lifespan, each with their own unique features and limitations. For this project, we'll make use of Nintendo's MMC5 mapper, since it's one of the few period-appropriate mappers that can manage this much RAM, and it's the only one that can also manage a full megabyte of ROM. That should be enough to store the emulator, PC BIOS, Linux kernel, and a file system, with some room to spare. Now we can't expect Linux to understand how to access any of this memory. What the hell is even that? So one of our emulator's main jobs will be to abstract away all of this hardware complexity, and present both RAM and ROM as one contiguous 20-bit address space for the emulated CPU to access. The CPU emulation will be divided into four main stages, those being fetch, decode, execute, and write. In the fetch stage, we calculate the address of the CPU's next instruction and copy the instruction byte by byte into the CPU's instruction cache. Next, in the decode stage, we analyze the instruction to determine what it does and what values it's working with. Those values are then copied to temporary locations for later use. Then, in the execute stage, we perform the instruction's computation and store the result in another temporary location. Lastly, in the write stage, the result is copied to its final destination before starting the process over again with the fetch stage. This explanation glosses over a lot of the fine details, but we're not here to do a deep dive on the x86 architecture. Generally speaking, this is enough to get the operating system running. And now all we need is a way to interact with it. Thankfully, ELKS makes this fairly easy, since it can be configured to use a serial terminal, meaning that we just need to write a simple terminal emulator to send and receive ASCII data, and fancy graphics can be restricted to the emulator's boot screen. 
This is NES86, an IBM PC emulator that runs Elks Linux on the NES. It runs slowly, as expected, and there's a noticeable delay between typing and characters appearing on screen, but critically, it doesn't drop keystrokes. This is because the terminal emulator and the PC emulator largely run independently of each other, allowing the keyboard to be read regularly even if the PC is busy. Now many of you will have noticed when the system booted that I'm making use of the Family Basic keyboard. This makes the system very convenient to use, but it does technically violate one of the restrictions that I laid out at the start of the video. So, to make this a purely NES experience, we can reboot the console with no keyboard attached to enable the on-screen keyboard. Pressing select at any time will open the keyboard and allow us to type regardless of what the rest of the emulator is doing. Now that we've got everything working, I think it's about time to show this all running on original hardware. But I can't. Unfortunately, my flash cartridge can't run NES86, and neither can most emulators for that matter. Probably because we're using more RAM and ROM than any commercial game ever did. But all hope is not lost. I can still think of one way to at least get closer to running on original hardware. For those who aren't aware, the first generation Animal Crossing games contain several playable NES titles each with its own unique furniture item. Interacting with one of these items will use an NES emulator, developed by Nintendo, to play the game indicated by the box on top of the console. And in addition to the playable NES items, there exists an empty NES item, which normally only displays the message, I want to play my NES, but I don't have any software. But, in 2018, James Chambers discovered that interacting with the empty NES item actually searches your memory card for additional NES ROMs, and allows most of the NES library to be played inside of Animal Crossing. We can use Kyler's AC NES Creator Tool to inject NES86 into a GameCube save file, but attempting to load it inside of Animal Crossing reveals a number of issues. Despite this NES emulator supposedly being one of Nintendo's most accurate, its MMC5 mapper implementation is lacking many features that NES86 relies on. So I guess it's time to stop relying on those features. Multiplication can be done in software instead of the MMC5's hardware, memory management code can be rewritten to accommodate the limited bank switching options, and the whole emulator can be optimized down to 16 kilobytes so that everything fits in just half a megabyte. The only thing we can't work around is RAM. Elks absolutely requires 128 kilobytes, and Animal Crossing's NES emulator does not give us a way to change the amount of available cartridge RAM. But we've come too far to give up now, and luckily, James Chambers has our back once again. James discovered that Animal Crossing's ROM loading functionality can be exploited to execute arbitrary code. If you want to know exactly how the exploit works, then I suggest you go watch Hunter R's video on the topic. For now, just know that the exploit lets us rewrite Animal Crossing's code by loading a specially crafted NES game from the memory card, and that, in theory, should enable us to increase the amount of cartridge RAM that the NES emulator can use. The hard part is figuring out what code needs to be modified to accomplish that, and this is where the Animal Crossing decompilation project comes to the rescue. Members of the project have already partially decompiled the NES emulator, and by continuing their work, we can determine what needs to be patched. Three weeks later. As it turns out, we only need to change two instructions to make Animal Crossing's NES emulator compatible with NES86. One instruction to increase the RAM allocation, and the other to set the number of usable RAM banks, while the rest of the emulator can remain Nintendo's original unmodified code. Now all that's left is to pass our instructions into James's patch generator to create a new GameCube save file, which, when loaded by the NES emulator, will patch Animal Crossing with our custom code, and if we've done our job right, we should now have Linux running on our PC emulator, on Nintendo's NES emulator, inside another giant emulator. And to celebrate this accomplishment, let's close out this video with a nice game of Tetris. At 30 seconds per frame. Let me know what you think of all this in the comments. Maybe if there's enough interest, I could try building a custom cartridge with a real MMC5. In the meantime, I've got some fun new project ideas to work on. Anyway. I'd like to give a special thanks to all the people that helped make this project possible. Thanks to the NES dev community, the Elks Linux developers, the Animal Crossing decompilation team, James Chambers, Kyler, and Hunter R. And last but not least, thank you for watching. Are you a simulation? Huh? Are you a simulation? No! No! You little son of a bitch!